Well, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, this title tells where my position is and where PSR's position is. And what I'd like to do is to kind of draw you through some of the reasons and what um, our concerns are. Um, um, as Harv mentioned, I am passionate about climate change. Um, when my son was 10 years old, I wanted to take him to the Great Barrier Reef because I was working on climate change and I knew he was going to die. So we went there, we snorkeled, we saw the amazing beauty of the Great Barrier Reef. And it was estimated that perhaps by 2030 or 2050 that the reef would be dead. Two-thirds of the northern half of the reef is now dead, and it's only 2017. So climate change and its impacts are accelerating, and I know most of you in this room are working on that, and so I'm really excited that you're here um, because there are many things that we can do uh, to advance um, a better future. So we're t fracking is, is done to get natural gas. We all need electricity. We all need heating. We all need to cook. Um, what should we do about that? Well, we can have a different future. And we can have it without climate pollutants. We can have it with half of the current water and air pollutants. And we can have more jobs. It's a win, win, win all the way around if we go for clean, renewable energy. So I want to ask you guys some questions. So most of us understand that burning coal is dirty, that burning coal creates a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. But what are we going to do instead, right? That's the question. So the first question is, does methane gas burn cleaner than coal? How many people say yes? yes. How many people say no? How many people don't know? Okay, well, that's honest. When you burn it in the electric plant, it burns cleaner. There's no mercury in it. There's very little sulfur dioxide, and we'll talk about that. So in the plant, it burns cleaner than coal. So maybe, maybe it is a good choice. That's why it's called natural gas. Is methane cl clean when it's mined? No. How many people say no? More people. How many people say yes? And how many people don't know? Okay, fair enough. So when we mine natural gas, in the olden days, it was kind of like putting a straw in the earth and pulling up natural gas in, in mechanisms and ways that we used to pull up oil. Much easier without doing a lot of other things, although there, there were still some problems. So we'll talk about why fracking may not be very clean. How much U.S. methane gas now comes from fracking? 30 percent. 70. 67 percent. Okay, so our natural gas mining and production in the United States, which was the leader in the world at one point, just as we used to be the leader in oil production, started waning. In fact, we were fighting in Oregon when I was in Oregon, importing liquid natural gas. And now we're fighting to stop exporting liquid natural gas. So fracking is now the major way we get natural gas. So does fracking and burning of methane emit lower levels of greenhouse gases than coal? That's part of what this talk is about. So we'll go over some of that data. So it's, those are the big issues on should we choose natural gas, as people have talked about, as a bridge fuel. Well, again, as I said, Physicians for Social Responsibility has studied this. We've put out a new report called Too da Dirty, Too Dangerous. We don't think so. We think that it is a dirty form of energy. It's a fossil fuel. That it, Methane is a potent greenhouse gas, and we'll talk about how much of that greenhouse gas gets into the um, atmosphere, and of course that we still need to deal with climate change. Okay, so how is fracking different than mining that used to happen, and why might it be dirtier? Well, I'm going to review some of these issues, but let me just show you on this diagram. Um, first, the wells are much deeper. 
they're a mile or two down. And then not only do they go down, but then they go sideways. So they go horizontally. And then they put in up to six million gallons, anywhere from, from two to six million gallons of water, mixed with chemicals, inject it down here into this well to try and fracture, which is why it's called hydraulic water, fracturing, and fracture that shale or sandstone layer to release um, methane gas so that it can come up the pipe and into the collecting system and refined and boom, we have methane gas. When they drill the well, they put a casing around the well with cement to try and protect where we get our well water from, or from the water table, okay? So that's a possible way that they can help protect our water from injecting these chemicals down into the ground. So the some of the water comes back up. Um, it takes a lot of trucks bringing all that water in. The gas comes up. The waste water is put sometimes often into an open pit and trucked away. The natural gas has to be refined and put into condensers to push it through pipelines. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, what's going to, what I'm going to kind of cover. Hydraulic fracturing or fracking is an industrial process. It's done here in Colorado, primarily in rural areas, but it's encroaching on cities. It's encroaching on where populations are greater. Each one of these is a well pad. It takes three to six acres. Each well pad can have 10 wells dug in it, okay? So the wells, as I mentioned, go one to two miles laterally. And if you were to look at this as a grid, here's one well pad with five wells going this way and five wells going that way. So if you think about it, if they really use all those well pads, the entire area underneath this particular well field is interlaced with these wells, okay? So it's not just down into the ground, it's laterally. So I mentioned that it takes two to six million gallons of water pushed down into that well with chemicals, right? So what's, what chemicals do they want to put in there? Well, they put in, it, it'll depend on whether it's Marcellus Shale, whether it's Colorado, whether it's uh, Texas. So it, it depends to some degree. They put in acid because that seems to help keep the, those little fractures open. Um, friction reducers and surfactants to help ease the flow back up. They want to prevent microorganism growth that might plug up the the various uh, systems and kill the organisms that are there, um, oxygen stabilizers, and then these are just some of the mechanisms for what they're trying to do with the chemicals that they use uh, in the system. So what do they use? Um, well, some of the chemicals that they use are human carcinogens. Um, they can be benzene, toluene, um, formaldehyde, formic acid, which turns into formaldehyde. Um, some of them may be neurotoxic, like lead, ethylene glycol, which is um, antifreeze, thank you. Some of the chemicals um, actually can be endocrine disrupting, which we've been hearing about in terms of chemicals um, harming our children and, and us in terms of our thyroid or reproductive um, chemicals. And it contaminates huge amounts of water, okay? So, um, I have some numbers here, and I want to make sure I have them accurately. Um, so benzene is a known carcinogen, okay? It is found naturally in oil and gas drilling. It is sometimes added um, to lubricate as well. Um, and it takes five drops of benzene in an Olympic-sized pool to make five parts per billion which is the EPA's level of below which is safe drinking water and above which is not safe. Okay, so when you think about 1% or even half a percent of the fracking fluid, 99% is water, but 1% is chemicals, 
then that means 50,000 gallons of chemicals are being pushed down each one of these wells. Okay, just to give you a sense of the volume that's going on. So, um, initially, and in Pennsylvania to this day, the fracking companies do not have to tell anybody what's in it. It's a trade secret. It's proprietary information. Now, Governor Hig Higginlooper, is my saying that right? Um, he said, that's not okay. We need to negotiate a mechanism so that people can understand what's in there, and Canada should have a right to know. So in 2011, um, the state of Colorado has a new regulation that says the company has to file within 60 days of fracking a well and tell people what's in, in the fracking fluid. It's listed on the frack um, focus website. Um, the, um, it, however, has a small loophole that if some of, the, want some of the chemicals that they're going to use are kind of their own devising that they feel for some reason have, you know, are very, very important for them to claim as a proprietary chemical, they can appeal to the commission and say, we really don't want to disclose what this chemical is, but we don't think it's harmful or we don't think this, that, or the other thing is a justification for why they don't want to disclose it. Um, they have to say how much, how much concentration is there as part of the disclosure form. Um, and they're supposed to send information to property owners that are near the wells that they're going to be fracking. Um, and a statement about how they should test their own wells if they, if they use well water or irrigation water to have a baseline well water test done. Okay? Do people know about this? Do you? Oh, okay. So 20 to 40 percent of the injected water with the chemicals in it does come back up um, spontaneously, as you mentioned. It actually, so some of it stays down there. Um, some of it comes back with other things. So you kind of led right into the next part. And one of the things that we recommend people check in their wells is whether or not their well has become more salty because the brine, the, the deep underneath the ground, there's a lot of salts of various sorts, and they come back up with the water as well. In fact, the salt content is part of the reason why wastewater and um, where they initially tried to send it to cities in, in, in Pennsylvania, I, I can't speak for Colorado, um, they tried to send it to, to city waste treatment plants, and they couldn't clean it. They can't clean this water to use it for, to, be, to make it potable, to make it irrigation um, worthy or ready. Commercial. Right. Commercial. So it comes back up also with some radioactive elements depending on what's underneath your ground. Um, so radon, uranium, uranium breaks down into radioactive polonium or radioactive lead. Those things come back up as well. Brings up other heavy metals like cadmium um, and Polyaromatic hard hydrocarbons are larger um, hydrocarbons that are also part of any gas and oil extraction process. So they come up as well. Um, and in fact, you were sort of commenting on, well, what do you do with this stuff? We would like to see them capture all of that um, at, the, at, the, at the top, including all the gases and clean and take and the methane, because that's what they're doing it for, is to get methane gas. But a lot of times they don't capture a lot of this gaseous stuff that comes up with the wastewater, um, and it's just let go into the atmosphere. So some of these polyaromatic hydrocarbons and, and other um, volatile or airborne chemicals can just go into the air. Um, so these, so what are the toxicities? So first we um, know that, um, well, let me just stop there. The wastewater is then taken. Sometimes it's put into a pit that should be lined um, so that some of the 
water can evaporate because we're talking still, even 20 or 40 percent of 6 million or 4 million gallons is still a whole lot of liquid that they have to bring the diesel trucks in, load them up, send them out, and sometimes they use that same frac fluid in another well. So, but sometimes they take the frac fluid and they put it into what's called an injection well meaning an old mining well or some other underground geological system because, again, they really can't clean it adequately to use it for anything else. Um, and that's potential, that is part of what is causing some of the earthquake issues um, as they go down there and is a potential contaminant if that well is not have that adequate casing, that cement lining that goes through the water table so that it doesn't contaminate the water table. So that's the water issues. The air issues, as I mentioned, uh, volatile organic compounds are one of the air toxics that come up uh, with it. Uh, methane obviously does. Um, these can't be seen with the naked eye. This is a condensing station. Um, but if you use infrared or FLIR um, visualization, you can see that this tank is leaking. So it's not perfectly containing the chemicals that are in there. Um, volatile organic compounds are not healthy for you. Um, they could be, include benzene, toluene, the BTEX um, scenario. Um, they, they can have significant toxic exposure within a half a mile um, for those who are downwind, and some feel ill effects within two to three miles. There are millions of condensate tanks around the country because they are there to help increase the pressure so that the natural gas, the methane gas, continues to go through the pipelines. The other air pollutants that occur at the well site, at the mining sites, are, is particulate matter. Um, now we're talking about particulate matter that is extremely tiny, so two and a half microns. Um, this is a human hair size, just to give you, you know, a um, understanding these little tiny particles get all the way down into your lung. They get all the way into your alveoli where only gases really should go. They also take with them heavy metals. They can take with them other compounds that are harmful. So particulate um, matter, whether it's from a coal burning power plant, whether it's from sulfur dioxide at the, at the well site of a natural gas plant, whether it's from the diesel exhaust, uh, whether it's from anything, um, is harmful to our health. And there are certain levels be below which we um, recommend, the EPA recommends that these levels stay. So with long-term repeated exposure, you have increased rates of heart attacks, arrhythmias, stroke, and even death. Um, and some of the studies that were done around these uh, occurred in Los Angeles when Al Atlanta had the um, Olympics and they told people not to drive their cars. Um, rates of these diseases went down. So particulate matter comes from many things, but it also will occur at the wellheads and mining fields for natural gas. Ozone. How many people have a hot tub? Do you use an ozonator? Okay, so ozone is three oxygens put together, and what does it do for your hot tub? It's a tremendous antibacterial. It zaps those little bugs. It kills microorganisms. So what do you think it does in your lungs? Not very good for you. Right, I call it having sunburn in the lungs. Um, so it's caustic. It exacerbates asthma. Some people think it can cause asthma. In studies, well done studies in, in Los Angeles in children who played more than two sports or three sports a year outside, um, their lungs over time were smaller than children who didn't play outdoors in levels that had significant beyond what is recommended for, by EPA for ozone levels. Now in Denver, your levels are not in compliance. Um, I, I think Denver has the 11th highest ozone levels, which has improved from nine last year. Um, and I think Fort Collins is 11th worst in, this, in the country in terms of cities and ozone levels. Um, it also affects unborn children, the fetus. 
Um, low birth weight babies are more likely in areas that have higher levels of ozone. Um, so it, it has a whole variety of chronic uh, lung and health consequences. Can we ask questions? Please. Go ahead and ask now. So um, on the previous film, because I'm, I'm very much into stats, um, the long-term repeated, repeated exposure and the children more vulnerable, I went over to um, the West Slope and visited some of my friends over there, and I noticed on the drive over that there's wellheads in a lot of places over in... Um, what is, where is that? Yeah, on the West Slope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But so has there been studies done within those communities that show um, the diseases and the, and the heart disease, and et cetera, within the communities that live around them currently? So we're going to look at some of those studies. Oh, Absolutely. And th that's real important. Okay. You know, so what I'm saying here is these toxics um, are harmful. They're more harmful the higher the level. So if the level is really low, they're less harmful. Um, the closer you are to the wellheads and to the exposure, the more likely you are to get more exposure. Um, there was a study that was done in uh, Pennsylvania that found that the particulates around, you know, in, in people who were living around these wellheads, um, their, their actual particulate levels were higher at night because there's more inversion. So it keeps the particulates from being dispersed. Um, so there are, but there are many things that we don't know. And all these places have not been studied to know exactly what the levels are because it's expensive. And nobody is making anyone test. So that's a problem. And that's what we should find out about. That's exactly the right, the, kind of the right place to go. So what is, what is the science shown? Yeah. I'm a little uh, unsure about the actual sources of particulates. You mentioned uh, sulfur, hydrogen sulfide, or and sulfur dioxide. Dioxide and then exhaust. From Diesel. But in the actual fracking operations, what are the sources of particulate matter besides the sulfur? That's it. That's it. Okay. So the particulates from the wells are, um, you know, again, you can argue that they're less than burning coal at the coal plant. Um, the Again, they haven't been studied very well. Uh, we, we do have good studies that tell you how much particulates are there from diesel exhaust, for example. So when that whole fracking process goes away, then the particulate levels are going to go down. Okay, so once the, the mine is producing natural gas, then the particulate levels will go down. Um, sulfur dioxide uh, is a gas. It is... Um, needs to be stripped from methane gas before the methane can be put into the pipeline because it interferes, and, and I'm not sure, I'm not a geologist or a gas expert, it interferes somehow with transporting um, the gas through a pipeline. So they work to get the sulfur dioxide out of the natural gas before they put it in the pipeline. So when you burn natural gas, it burns cleaner because it doesn't have sulfur dioxide in it, whereas coal has high levels of sulfur dioxide produced. Which, yeah. Uh, the diesel that you mentioned and some of this other particulate matter, is that related to the hundreds of trucks going by to set the... That, that hundreds to thousands mm -hmm, for each well. Right, so these are 24-7 trucks going back and forth during the time of fracking. And what's the time frame when it takes to set a well up? <laughs> Does anyone know? Two to four weeks. Two to three weeks. Two to three weeks. You mean spud to completion or fracking a well? Fracking a well doesn't take two to four weeks. Okay. Well, Getting all the materials there? I mean, the, 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 the operation uh -huh. is not two to four weeks. Yeah, I, I don't know that, so. Sorry, you operation. Wait, well, the, the actual fracking of a well. So you mean after you have the water there and the, no. everything done? Or Halliburton's anything? there and everything's getting ready to go and they're starting to pump. And it can take depending upon how many stages you use in your lateral, it can take days. But it's not going to be two to four weeks. Okay. We went two to four weeks from spudding the well. Okay, spudding the well. That's a different deal. The spudding the well. For, for the common public, we're using the term fracking well as one that's drilled down and horizontally and then fracked. So it's the whole operation. Well, 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 it's yeah. Because if you're Halliburton, that's just the act of fracking. 
If you're a citizen, it's the whole well. Now, this is but in terms of the pollution that's there and the number of trucks, it will be less w while they're getting ready and more when you're bringing the, the water in and you're trucking the water out. Well, I mean, it's a heavy industrial activity. The disruptions to people. So the engineering divisions aren't necessarily very valuable to people because they have to live with this for weeks and weeks on end. And so the, the entire operation probably takes two to three weeks, that's what they like to say, but ask people who've been around it, see how they feel. Okay, so, so some of the pollution things, um, there have been studies that look in certain areas, and obviously just like Denver has higher levels of ozone because of its structure. You know, there's a lot of inversions that happen here. So one of the studies in Win um, Uinta County, um, Utah, one of the highest producing oil and gas fields in the United States has shown dangerously high levels of volatile organic compounds and ozone um, that continue. Um, so the ozone is also created just from methane. Um, I don't know that I mentioned that before. So methane itself is a volatile organic compound. Okay, so when it's leaking, it can combine with nitro nitrogen oxides and sunshine and create ozone. So it's not just at the time of fracking that you have high levels of ozone present. Um, in Colorado, dangerous levels of benzene were found um, by a study that was done by Dr. McKenzie from the University of Colorado. Um, and I want, again, I want to make sure I have the numbers right. Um, and the documentation there included elevated risks of cancer for people living within a half a mile of, the, of a drilling site. Um, ambient benzene and carbon disulfide uh, levels were found to be excessive in northern Texas. Um, and in fact, one, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality felt that the hydrogen disulfide uh, was a disaster potential for explosion. Um, so there are areas that have excessive levels of benzene and um, ozone um, and volatile organic compounds, but not all have been tested. So where, and where was the benzene in Colorado? Where was that location, the site? Do you have that? Um, I can give you the, the um, citation. Yeah. Which is gradual. Okay. Okay. So, again, the EPA and states have stated, you know, we want levels of certain toxins in the air and in the water to be below certain levels because when they are above that, we understand that they cause health harm. So the second sort of level of studies is, do we sh are we showing negative health harm at these locations? Okay, so the first study that I have listed up here um, is um, a study that was done in, let me find this, um, University of Pennsylvania and Columbia University, and they showed a statistical association between the density of fracked wells and people in proximity to them and increased rates of hospitalization overall. Um, they, they looked at 93,000 patient records and found um, that uh, these conditions were elevated in the areas that had the highest well densities, including a 27% higher level of cardiac hospitalizations. Um, in counties, the two counties that, were, that had high well density in comparison to a control county um, that did not have wells or fracking at the time. Um, another study um, that was um, um, came out in the Journal of American Medical Association uh, in 2016 showed an association between fracking and asthma exacerbation. So again, they looked at patient records. Um, they rated people's asthma response in mild, meaning that they had an exacerbation, moderate, that they had to add a new medication, and extreme or s severe, needing um, a visit to the emergency room or a hospitalization. Um, and they found that in 35,000 patients with asthma, that there was, again, a, 
um, a, a statistically significant association uh, with a 4.4 increase frequency in mild exacerbations and in a 1.5 increase frequency of hospitalization. So being in, um, again, close proximity is causing increased rates of asthma and exacerbation. Um, lastly, um, in a 2014 study of almost 25,000 births, live births, researchers found a statistical association between um, serious birth defects and the density and how close the proximity they were to natural gas wells to where mothers lived at the time of pregnancy. This was done in rural Colorado and the um, population that was looked at or the, the births uh, occurred between 1996 and 2009. Um, the strongest association was between the density and proximity within a 10-mile radius of where the mother lived uh, and the prevalence particularly of congenital heart defects, which is the most common um, serious birth defect in children. Um, a study that was published last year that some of you know about, uh, again, here in, um, actually in North and Central Pennsylvania, a statistical association was found between expectant mothers living in the most fracked areas and increase in high-risk birth and premature birth. Now, premature birth is considered a marker for um, a difficult um, health outcome, worse health outcome uh, over time. Um, and they found that the expectant mothers living in the most actively fracked areas were 30% greater risk of a high-risk pregnancy and 40% more likely to give birth prematurely. That doesn't mean that 40% of mothers gave birth prematurely, but that there was a 40% increase in mothers who gave birth prematurely. Um, so there are health outcomes that are being shown in places that have um, high-density fracking. Did they, did they see any correlation between miscarriage? They didn't look at that. That would be an important thing to look at. Absolutely. So I just want to review. Where do these toxins come from and how can they potentially get in the water and in the air? So as I mentioned before, there's supposed to be a casing and sometimes there's a double casing. So you have the pipe and then you have a cement around it. Sometimes there are extra things put in here um, near the top to stabilize the, the, the piping and the casing. The casing is supposed to go down through the water table, um, and then, of course, the pipe goes all the way down and horizontally. Initially, it was felt that this was so deep that methane couldn't get up to the water table. But now there are some studies um, that show that it, there is methane in some areas in well water, um, in the areas, and it's not necessarily coming from the pipe. Obviously, it could come from the pipe as well as the methane is coming up the pipe. Um, again, we get potential contamination, as we saw in that one picture, where they're, they're you know, having that pipe come out with all that backflow of water being dumped into this pond, and it's being dumped some on the ground. And when animals have drunk some of this water, they die because it is toxic. Um, so this is supposed to be contained and then trucked out. Um, obviously, they aerosolize and try and get more water off. They can also aerosolize and increase levels of benzene and other um, toxins of volatile organic compounds. The um, natural gas has to be cleaned. Sulfur dioxide has to be removed. Um, so that's done in close proximity to these. Um, the um, truck um, diesel um, is a problem as well. And then you have the whole structure and pipelines that can leak as well. So you have all of these potential locations where you can get air and water toxicity. Now, the EPA, yeah? Um, back on the East Coast, when the coal miners, they, contact, they contracted a black lung disease due to working in the mines. Have they shown any impact of working on these rigs um, with the employees mm -hmm. on a continual basis? Do they have any health? They do, and I haven't, I haven't put that data into this talk, okay. but they do. They do. 
Yes, yeah, you have some conditions such as uh, silicosis uh, from the from the, the silica. I think um, was it OSHA had to issue uh, an emergency health alert a few years back because of the, the extreme prevalence of, of, of silicosis happening with well workers. I think also it's a, a risk of uh, benzene uh, blood poisoning uh, that uh, is also part of the exposure. So they're supposed to be wearing protection. Um, around these materials and not spill them on themselves. Um, and yes, a number of them have spilled them on themselves and gotten very sick. Um, silicosis comes from sand. They use a special very fine sand that helps prop open those little fractured spots. Um, and if it's not managed and it's allowed to blow around, people breathe it in and they can get lung disease, which is called silicosis. I didn't mention that. Okay. So the EPA um, was instructed to do a report on whether or not there was evidence of water pollution from fracking. And they put out the report, and their final report came out last December. Um, and basically what it says is that their cases of impacts are happening in every single way I told you. Okay, so there's, there's documentation of all this kind of pollution at different places, but unfortunately, we feel that there are significant data gaps, that there are uncertainties in the available data that doesn't allow us to actually calculate what are the percentage of problem that we are actually going to find. And part of that is, is because people don't do well water testing before fracking happens and then do it afterwards so that you actually know, okay, well, I ha now have methane in my water and I can't be told, well, maybe it was there before. Um, or, you know, you may have had, you know, radon and, and it's not from the fracking, it is just naturally occurring in your well. So it's hard to get a lot of this data and make sure that is it from the fracking or not. But they did say that, yes, that various types of pollution, both air and water, or it's actually this is particularly on water, is occurring, but we can't say how much. So that is part of the issue of round fracking. The other part of the issue around fracking is what is it doing for climate change, okay? So methane, carbon dioxide, I like to say, is the same as putting on a windbreaker, okay? When you put on a windbreaker, you feel a little bit warmer, right? Because, you know, your body exudes heat, it's called radiant heat, and the windbreaker keeps it in, right? If you put on a fur coat and a fleece and a sleeping bag, you'd be putting methane on, okay? So methane is much better at absorbing radiant heat when it's in the atmosphere, okay? And in fact, over the first 20 years after you release a methane molecule, it is 86 times more heat absorbing than carbon dioxide, okay? So it's more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide is. Over 100 years, which is what most of the calculations previously have been done on, it's still 20 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Now, methane breaks down in the atmosphere relatively quickly in about 12 years, but it breaks down into carbon dioxide and water vapor. Okay, so it, and carbon dioxide takes over 100 years to be absorbed. Is that why over time the methane becomes less and less potent? Because it breaks down the CO2 and water? Mm hmm Right. And I, you know, it, that was hard to find. We had, you know, having all this good science stuff. Do need carbon dioxide and water? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And that's part of the natural carbon cycle. But we're talking about taking a fossil fuel that's deep underground, and, and bringing it up to the atmosphere and letting that methane go into the atmosphere or letting the carbon dioxide go in the atmosphere when it wasn't part of the cycle, at least not for many hundreds of thousands of millions of years, okay? Um, why do I care about 20 years? I care about 20 years because the scientists have told us um, in a report that just came out a month ago, we have four years to continue emitting greenhouse gases at the rate we're emitting them now to stay below 1.5 degrees centigrade. Okay? If we start lowering our emissions, then we'll have more time. But it's important that we realize that the potential 
harm from methane escaping into the atmosphere and being a greenhouse gas is very important over that 20-year time period. So we have been encouraging, and many other groups have been encouraging the EPA, to use the 20-year time period when you're measuring and calculating what's the impact of methane on greenhouse gas. Because we're getting to a tipping point, and we're getting to a lot of tipping points. I'm just going to give you one. As the air temperature increases, the ground warms up, permafrost melts, the houses in Alaska fall over because they're, they're really on, on ice, and that permafrost releases more carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere. This is called a positive feedback loop. And there's a number of them in climate change. Yeah? Just speaking of that, I was just reading a report in the last couple of days about in, the, uh, in Siberia how there are these massive explosions way bigger than this church that are happening right now, thousands of them where um, methane gas is because it's falling making these big releases, popping these huge methane bubbles, and so that vast amount of methane is also escaping you. Know? Right. So we know that the permafrost is melting in some areas. Um, in some areas, it's not. Um, so it's a very complex system. So as a health professional, I care about climate change because it harms our health, and it's harming our health now. It's doing that. We already, worldwide, the temperature has gone up 1.53 degrees. Fahrenheit in the last century. If we do not slow that down, the temperature worldwide will go up by 8.6 degrees. In other words, if we stay at the same level. Now, in the summer, that 8.6 degrees actually is 8 to 15 degrees average hotter by the end of the century if we don't bring these emissions down. Um, obviously, this particularly affects the elderly. People have heat stroke. I've had heat exhaustion, it's not pretty, it can kill people, people who have to work outside, people who don't have air conditioning, a lot of the people in India, a lot of people in New Orleans, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's vulnerable populations are most impacted. Second major health thing, I'm gonna go through these sections really quick because this isn't the focus, but um, is that we are seeing increased amounts of extreme weather events and that are contri uh, contributed and caused by climate change. <clears throat> the Northeast is the worst, with 74% increased rate of precipitation events that are uh, greater than two inches. Um, here in Colorado, it's more like 12%. Um, Pacific Northwest, we get deluged, I used to live in Oregon, we get deluged all the time. But basically, this is happening across the country and what we all know what happens when we get deluged, where there are floods. There are health impacts to floods. People die in floods. We get increase in mold. This is a particularly gross picture. Um, we, we harm our bridges in our roads, and we have to use money to fix them instead of using money to do other things. Um, the number of extreme weather events in 2016 were 15 in the United States. And that's not just one billion, it's anything over one billion per episode. And you can look up this on the um, um, NOAA website. Yeah. Well, it's also on NRDC. Um, there was a recent um, report that came out about the water system here in Colorado. And if I were in Colorado, I would be real worried about all that fracking water that's being taken up from whatever river and creek you have to be put down into a well. Um, because you know what? You're having less water here in three different ways. So you're having less water in the Colorado River partly because the temperatures are just higher and more of it evaporates. The plants take up more water when it's hot. They need more water to survive, just like we do. Secondly, long -term, near, long, large near-term projected um, snowpack um, is definitely projected um, in the western United States, including Colorado. Um, and you're already seeing earlier snow melts um, occurring. And depletion of groundwater. As you know, it gets drier, people pump more, um, plants need more irrigation. And then what does that do to the water be left behind? Well, when you make water more concentrated, the toxins or the, the chemicals or you know, even just the particulates that are in it are more concentrated. So um, we run into problems with that. And then the second big impact that I think is a big one in health is that our food costs more. So when you get crop failures, food prices go up. 
Ragweed season is going up the further north you go um, in terms of pollen, and then the other health impacts are increased ozone just because of increase in hot temperatures, um, fire, which you guys are all know about with your 14-year-long drought, um, increasing all sorts of respiratory illnesses, and, and again, this is another source of particulates. Um, so I just wanted to just underline the health component of climate change, just to kind of remind people about that. So what's the leakage rate of methane? That's the big deal, right? Um, it, it can escape all those same ways that we got those vol volatile organic compounds, so I'm not going to repeat myself. Um, what is this? It's flaring. So methane, instead of being captured and put in a pipeline, is being burned because they know they're releasing it. So they don't have all the capture material always ready to grab the stuff, especially when the well is first done. Um, blowback is um, something that happens that they want to clear out the tubes, and so they do that without capturing any of the methane. So the condensate tanks, the pipelines, um, they, they deliberately release methane because they're trying to clean out the system. Um, so some of that venting occurs deliberately, and then there are leaks all the way along. So we'll talk about some of those. There are three million abandoned wells in the United States. Okay, now, how much is leaking from them? Or at what rate? We don't know. 5% of wells leak immediately. And then over time, um, they at least 50% of them leak. So we're having methane leakage from old wells and new wells. Um, leakage comes from transport lines, compressor stations, delivery pipelines, and storage facilities. Um, as you, you know about the um, Aliso Canyon event where that methane storage tank leaked for five months. People had to be evacuated from the area. They could see the plume from outer space. It was the equivalent of 11 million cars on the road for a year was the greenhouse gas equivalent of that particular leak. Um, this is a study that was done in Boston looking at the pipelines that are bringing gas to your and my home to make our heating system work or our gas stove work. Six leaks had to be repaired immediately because the level was so high it had explosive potential. Um, there were an additional 3,300 leaks that were discovered, and the company that runs those pipes um, basically said, we can't fix every leak. We just kind of work on the pipes in an ongoing fashion um, over time, unless we're told about it. Because, again, it's, it's expensive to fix leaks. Um, so we're having significant um, leakage as well in the delivery systems. So the numbers are all over the place in terms of what, um, what would make it equivalent to coal. So when you burn natural gas in a electric plant, right, and you burn coal in an electric plant, how much CO2 are you, less are you releasing from, um, from a natural gas plant? People know? It's, it's 40 to 50, and it depends on how efficient that natural gas plant is compared to the coal plant that you're replacing it with. So, say 50%. So, if we just captured all the methane, and we burned it, and we made electricity, it would be 50% better than, than coal. But we don't burn it all. We leak some of it, right? So, if you look at the Electricity Journal, which is a journal for the electric companies, they estimate that if you have a leakage rate greater than 4%, then you're just as bad as coal. Okay? Other people, other companies, and this one is from the in experimental research letters, say this, the methane leakage rate is above 2%, then it's worse, or as bad as coal, okay? And this is based on lots of calculations um, and, and so on. And then there's a whole bunch of other, you know, what does the EPA say? Well, unconventional gas definitely leaks more than old-fashioned conventional natural gas. Uh, mining, um, the EPA says that that leakage rate is 3.9%. So that's the same as coal, okay? Um, there are others that say it's lower. I think the lowest is 1.6. 
not much lower than what some people estimate are going, again, to be the same. So there's a variety of ways of looking at this, and nobody is in complete agreement, but how much is actually leaking? And so the range basically is between 1.3 and 1.9 percent. There was a study that um, was done by um, EDF, NOAA, and a variety of universities that took planes over the whole, a whole region in the um, Barnett Shale, uh, North uh, Texas area, and basically came up with these numbers. However, the oil and gas industry were told when they were flying over, and, um, and they were all done during the day. Um, so we don't know, you know, if there's more leaks at night. We, you know, we just don't know that. Another uh, organization used um, special kinds of measurements that were from satellites and came up with a level across um, the shale areas that said 9 to 10 percent was leaking, okay? And of course, we know that over the Four Corners area, for reasons we don't completely understand, there's an incredible amount of methane over that whole area. Um, Maybe so. There you go. I got there's a lot of coal there, too. <laughs> there's a lot of coal, and coal mining uh, releases 10% of methane. Right. 10% of the methane that's estimated to be released. Yeah. When you're talking about this leaking, are you talking about just the time that the, is the measurements just when the operation is going, or how, do you, how are you accounting for what's in the ground that's leaking into the, potentially leaking into the aquifer? Right, so there's two ways to measure it. One is actually to try and do drive-by, where you're actually grabbing air samples, right? But it's hard to um, say that that applies to all the wells. Maybe there's some bad well drillers or ones that had bad cement and they're leaking a whole lot. And then there's other really good guys who don't leak very much, and I'm sure there is a big difference between some of the operators out there. Um, so some of it is on the ground, so that's the ground up. And then there's the top down. How much methane is over this region as a whole? And if we hold things steady and we, we there are ways to fingerprint methane, costs a lot of money, um, to say is it coming from a landfill, is it coming from those cows belching, um, the goats belching, <laughs> and all the other locations where you're, where you're producing well, methane? This work is done with fingerprinting. Yeah. The work by Noah is is fingerprinting the methane to the fossil oil and gas. Right. It's not termite methane. It's not coal methane. Right. Coal methane. It's fingerprinted to the fracking source. Right. Thank you for clarifying that. That's great. So again, if we come back to what, how much is too much, even this, this particular study, um, which was done with the flyover, with fingerprinting, um, maybe too much as well, or as bad as. Again, we're coming, you know, we're trying to synthesize this information and say, should we be building more natural gas plants to give us electricity instead of coal? Um, so it's a complex comparison. If you look at and do your calculations over a 100-year period, of course, the methane doesn't look as bad. But if you do your calculations over a 20-year period, Methane looks pretty bad as a greenhouse gas and may not get us where we need to get, which we talked about, to keep our permafrost from melting. Um, so what's the life of a gas plant? 40, years. 40 to 60 years. So if, if you know, PGE in my state builds a new gas plant, they're not going to have money to invest in a solar farm or new wind turbines. So, so we end up with, um, that's the big impact as well. Where are we going to be um, putting in, uh, where are we going to put our money? And just for icing on the cake, how about that job issue? Don't we all want jobs? Absolutely. It's a health issue if people are unemployed. People need good wage level jobs to bring home food and, and support their families. Um, the number of solar jobs in 2015 was 209,000 209, in the United States. The number of wind jobs was 88,000. How many oil and gas jobs are in the United States? Yeah, 180,000. There you go. 
So we already have more solar jobs in the United States than we have oil and gas. Energy efficiency, if you count all the different kinds of energy efficiency, building new um, energy efficient appliances, doing all the building work, doing mass transit, uh, doing you know, um, the new vehicle uh, issues, this is the number of jobs that we could have. Okay, So if it's a, a jobs issue, we really can make more jobs by having a clean energy future and needing less electricity in the first place. Um, so we have a lot of policy choices that we can make. Yes? Was the calculation on the, the renewable appliances, does that include um, alternative energy cars such as... Um, yep, it does. Um, so in the, sh in the short term, we have a lot of wells. We should be demanding that they capture all the methane that's possible. There have been a, a number of studies um, done by uh, EDF and uh, calculations that are done by Union Concerned Scientists that say that if they did the things like checking for those leaks more frequently on site, uh, capturing that methane when it comes up back out of the well, when you capture the water, um, do, repairing and monitoring the pipelines, that you can get a 40% reduction in leaks. Is that a good thing? Absolutely. Um, so I was very pleased that there was um, the regulation that was put out for new, not current, but new natural gas uh, regulations on federal land had to require some of these things. And there, it did not get overturned in the uh, Senate. The vote was last week. Um, so we should be monitoring frequently, um, but there's lots of policies for clean energy that we should be um, advocating for as well. Um, because again, if, if you're like me, and you're concerned about that data you just saw about the greenhouse gas methane, and whether it's as bad as coal, we should really be investing in solar, wind, and energy efficiency right now. Can it work? Spain is 19% on wind energy. Last summer, Germany was 50% on solar and wind renewable energy without having everything fall apart. Um, so there's issues with that. But what I'm saying is that right now we can be investing without harming our grid, without things falling apart in solar and wind. Who's number one in wind in the world? Texas. Denmark. Denmark. China. China. Who's number two? Seychelles. They have five, five wind I'm talking total production. Who's number two? United States. Absolutely. Um, Texas is 11% on wind. Iowa is over 30% on wind. It can be done. Um, so there's lots of good policies that um, we may want to have a conversation about um, that you guys are working on in this state, the uh, Ready for 100, 100% clean energy in cities by 2030, I believe, and then an additional... Right, okay. Production tax credits, um, there's lots of... Um, there's a lot, been lots of tax credits over the years and continues to be for oil and gas industry. We should continue the protection cash credits for wind and solar because the capital costs are greater up front, right? You put solar on your house, you pay $20,000 up front, and then you get paid back over, t over eight years. Mine got paid off in five years in terms of payback. Um, so, but you don't pay fuel costs. So you're not paying for that natural gas bill every month. Um, it's, it, it makes a big difference. So how much better is burning methane gas than coal? It's at least as bad. It's at least equal. Some studies show that it's worse in terms of greenhouse gases. Is mining, transport, and burning of methane gas any better than burning, than burning coal? It probably is still, because we're not getting mercury and some of the other pollutants. But um, tr mining and transport of, fra of methane gas isn't as good as we thought it might have been, and, and you guys know that more than we do. From a climate standpoint, that's not true. It might be from a health standpoint, but from a climate standpoint, methane leaks are extreme, and and we should probably have better studies looking at that. Why has the EPA not done studies or called for studies 
for better measurement of methane leakage because they didn't want to know. Um, because somebody told them they didn't want to know, okay? Um, so we don't know for sure. At least here this in Denver Julesburg Basin, though, we're leaking at 4%, and which is worse than 3.2, so it's worse. Okay, right. there you go. And it's as high as 19% in North Dakota. So, I mean, that's... So that's looking at other studies. So again, there's a lot of people in this room who know a lot. 4% is like one of the best as well <clears throat> for the climate. Great. So um, basically, I think many of you in the um, audience are already involved with groups that are working on this issue who care about the health of Coloradans, that care about climate change and its health impact, and that clean energy is a win-win-win. Um, so pushing for more clean energy, having that vision will keep us from having to continue to frack. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.